Hi, this is Roger Green, host of the Surfing the Mass Tsunami podcast. This week, we are offering four conversations from episode 16, our episode remembering Stephen Harrison with Donna Cryer, Jorn Schottenberg, and Dimitar Tonev. Plus, from the vault, the last new drug study Stephen ever shared on the podcast, which was last July. This conversation shares the first half of my interview with Dimitar Tonev, whose tribute comment to Stephen I shared in a recent Surfing Mesh weekly episode and was well received on the Surfing Mesh website and LinkedIn. Because this was Dimitar's first appearance on Surfing Mesh, he starts by telling the audience a bit about his history, including the fact that he came to know Stephen from the viral hepatitis days before we were even focusing on MASH. As his one unique thing, Dimitar mentions his proficiency as a skier, which leads me to ask Dimitar about his description of Stephen in the Surfing MASH eulogy note as a, and I quote, clumsy skier, unquote. Uh, Dim states that maybe that wasn't entirely fair to Stephen. His form wasn't the best, but he skied with energy and passion, took a couple of tumbles, but never seemed to get hurt. He then goes on to tell a different story about how he broke Stephen's glasses the first time they met, sat on them, I'm thinking, and how Stephen was able to laugh about it at the moment moment, and they were both able to laugh together about it in the years that followed. Dimitar describes the, and I quote, really impressive way, unquote, Stephen developed his process for recruiting patients into what were then called NASH studies through the first iterations of Summit, the first real idea of a site network. In response to a question from me, he described the pre-screening pathway as one element of the secret sauce, and then use of portable fiber scan devices is another, and goes on to dis- explain that Stephen's sites could recruit as many as eight times as many patients per month as a typical CRO, which is why Summit Network has become a preferred provider to many CEOs, a standard for all of us, and why no one has yet been able to quite replicate his success. I'm simply going to repeat what I said at the end of uh, episode 14, Conversations. Stephen was one of the most unique individuals I've ever had the pleasure to know and work with. These conversations touch on just a small sampling of what made Stephen Stephen. So just sit back, listen, learn, absorb. When you're done, check out and perhaps contribute to the memorial page on our LinkedIn discussion group. We'd love to hear your recollections as well. And here's our second interview with me interviewing Dimitar Tonev. So our uh, second uh, interview of this episode is with our friend Dim Tonev. Uh, uh, Dim, how are you doing today? Dimitar Tonev. I'm doing great. I'm still under the impression of the tremendous loss we felt. Just came back from a major American conference and I was looking around to see a familiar face and figure of Stephen Harrison. And we had a tribute to him at one of the Mass OD sessions. So I still do not completely believe that he is no longer with us, Roger. Uh, I still don't get it. You and several others. I'm going to want to talk about that in a second. I have one brief thing I want to say, and then I have a couple of things I'd love for you to do for us. First of all, uh, this discussion with Tim, originally we were going to try to get Tim and Donna together yesterday. That didn't work, so we're doing them separately. This is the kind of discussion I would like to have with anyone who'd like to talk about their experiences with and feelings about Stephen. Um, we will post this one as part of our weekly episode this coming week, but we will post others on the memorial page, and we will put, uh, send them out as midweek special conversations for people to hear. So, um, Tim, since you've not been with the podcast before, I'd like you to do me two favors one at a time. First, take a minute or two and tell our audience about your background, what you do now and how you got here. And we'll talk about how you came to work with Steven in a minute, but let's just start with you. So my name is Dimitri Tonev. I'm uh, originally from Bulgaria, but spent the last 20 years uh, working in different pharmaceutical company developing uh, treatments for liver diseases, mostly viral hepatitis, as well as NASH and cholestatic liver disease. That was out of London, currently based in Paris and leading the medical franchise of a French company called Ibsen, which inherited our Fibronor from another French company called Genfit. So that's the one of the connections with the Nash domain, the other one being Intercept, where I have spent a couple of years again running studies in, in this direction. I'm uh, a trained as hepatologist, but spent most of the last uh, 10 years in drug development, as I said, and I know Stephen from the time when he was also interested in viral hepatitis and was able to see his gradual transition of his interest, scientific pedigree and endless energy into the field of NASH, what we called NASH at the time. So Mm -hmm. that was a massively important journey, not only for him personally, but also for the entire field. So I was privileged to be one of the witnesses and I hope one of his friends. Okay, good. Before we go to Stephen, then one more thing. Can you please tell our audience one thing about you that they wouldn't know if you didn't tell them? Something a little different. I'm a decent skier, and that's uh, another connection with Stephen and with the rest of the team that it's organizing NASHTAC uh, every January. So definitely my favorite conference, not only because of the excellent skiing, but also because of the open spirit of communication and sharing, which is uh, quite important for this field. And I always enjoy it immensely. Okay, so interesting. In the tribute that you wrote to Stephen and LinkedIn, one of the things that you talked about was clumsy skier. So now that 
you mentioned that. I'm wondering if you have a skiing story uh, with you and Stephen that ties in some way back to that description. Yeah, that was probably not very polite, but Stephen was compensating, uh, let's say, the lack of technical skills that Joran is demonstrating with his power and sheer will. So I wouldn't necessarily say his skiing technique was really sophisticated. I- I've seen him a couple of times stumbling, but that's not really a particularly interesting story. But there, I have another story to tell. When we reconnected in a discussion about NASH after the time when we were discussing, uh, obviously, viral hepatitis C when he was still with the army, with VA, that was in a restaurant in Oxford with a bunch of other guys. Uh, the CEO of a MRI company called Perspectum was there and Stephen was sitting with his uh, lovely wife uh, and one of these chairs. One reason or another, I was quite, of course, impressed and a little bit shaky to meet the great professor. He just became an Oxford University professor at this point in time. So I was not very careful when one reason or another, Stephen had left his glasses right next to his chair, effectively where I was sitting. So my first interaction with Stephen was effectively breaking his glasses. Well, it was not such a pleasant moment, I guess, for both of us, but I resorted to joking about this not being my, you know, intention uh, to, you know, connect with him. But I think it all together was a really funny moment. And we were remembering this a couple of times afterwards. One of the um, really interesting things about Stephen was his ability to see the humor in everything. He was indeed. He was <laughs> able to turn uh, some uh, not all, all, always funny situation into something funny. Oh, definitely something that you could learn from. You said you looked around at the... Uh, DD, I wasn't at DDW, but I'm sure that's going to be the way every one experiences Milan. You know, I mean, Stephen was just some, so much energy everywhere he went that uh, I'm, I'm sure the vacuum is um, tangible. Tell our audience a little bit about how you viewed Stephen's role in the Mosul community and what it meant for you and your work. I will bring a slightly different angle that I don't know whether anybody else was able to discuss. What was a massive contribution of Stephen, which is outside of pure science and uh, enormous amount of publication and first authorships and presentation and conferences and stuff. What I think he changed in a, in a really impressive way was the very practical process of patient recruitment into national MASH studies. So he largely created with the first iterations of Summit the idea of site network and there was initially a, a bunch of friends of Stephen or former colleagues uh, from military which were having their own units and were interested to help him to recruit these patients and that was initially ridiculed but very very quickly became such a, an impressive I would say organization that there was a time when big CROs that were spending, uh, you know, 20, 30 years trying to do what Stephen uh, ended up doing in a couple of years, was so impressed by him that he was a preferred partner. His summit network was a preferred partner to be bundled together with the rest of the units and research sites of the CRO in order for them to stand the chance to win business in NASH during big defense meeting. He became a formidable delivery uh, organization for patients in NASH trials and I think that's something that uh, very few guys uh, are recognizing, but uh, CRO industry till this day is not able to replicate. So that's that's interesting. Um, what do you think is the magic or the special sauce behind how he made that work? And how much of that was about him and how much of that was about how he thought about it? A couple of things that I'm aware, of course, there are many, many uh, secret uh, and magical uh, elements that probably nobody knows, or at least I don't know. I think there was a very rational idea, first of all, that we will have to create and deploy a pre-screening pathways. While we knew ever since uh, what kind of histological features these patients need to demonstrate eventually when the two uh, pathology readers agree on their NAS score and their fibrosis score. Very few guys initially were thinking that this, to a certain extent, could be predicted by non-invasive technology. So Stephen was one of the first ones that started thinking, okay, if I have a certain cap on fibroscan and a certain reading of traditional elastography again on fibroscan, this, to a large extent, will 
will predict the potential for these patients to be approved for the study when the slide is finally seen by Zach Goodman and, and Pierre Bedos. So the very idea to make sure that the patient is likely a good candidate for NASH study before he or she meets the biopsy needle. I think Stephen was one of the first guy that started to do that. And some of those, uh, you know, pre-screening pathways or selection of criteria that the patients will have to demonstrate to be considered for biopsy was created by him. And a little bit of technical jargon here, most of the CROs will plan for NASH study, a recruitment of approximately half patients per site per month. And Stephen was, I was uh, able to see this with my very eyes and probably applies to many other units uh, outside of his own pinnacle in the limits of summit, we're getting to a level of four patients per site per month, yeah. which is massive and very, very difficult and also required something else that he was doing. He was able to take his portable fibro scan. Um, um, this is not meant to be an endorsement for the company or some of our friends that are providing these services uh, as a commercial service, but was definitely a very pragmatic way to find patients. And now, back to Roger. We hope you've enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions or comments about the content of this conversation or the entire episode, please put them in the review section of the page from which you downloaded this conversation or send an email to questions at surfingmanage.com. Next week, we will preview the Easel Congress 2024 with President Alexander Krag, Jörn Schattenberg, and perhaps some of the other key European KOLs. Until then, stay safe, surf on. We'll see you on the podcast. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.